Hey guys, this is MJ at His Truly, locating and educating prodigals at risk in these final hours, moments, nanoseconds prior to the rapture of the church. Yay! Who's ready to go to be with Jesus? Um, I think all of us are ready by now. Um, guys, we are in the final moments of the end of this dispensation called grace, and we are all ready to go. I don't know about these crickets or whatever they are out here, but I'm going to give it a shot. Missed you guys. I wanted to hop on here and just um, just share what the Lord's putting on my heart. Um, out of Behold, I Stand at the Door and Knock, my first book. This is called The Spirit and the Bride Say Come. And if you're on here and you don't know that the rapture is about to take place, if you don't know that normal's not coming back, normal's not coming back, guys. Jesus Christ is coming back soon and very soon. Could happen before this video is over. So I'm going to share the gospel so that you know and you have an informed choice to make. For God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into this world to condemn this world, but through him we might all be saved. But not all of us will be saved. A lot of us will believe the liars lie. Satan is a liar. And he came to steal, kill, and destroy. And there are a lot of prodigals out there who believe the lie that God has forsaken them. God has left them. And that's a lie from the pit of hell. He never leaves us. Jesus never leaves us. And he never forsakes us. Eternal life is just that. Eternal. The Gospels, 1 Corinthians 15 one through four that jesus christ died for our sins according to scripture that he was buried and on the third day rose again according to scripture that is the simple gospel of our salvation jesus said we must be born again to enter into the kingdom of heaven how do we get from point a to point b the only way to the father is through the son not buddha muhammad allah the prayers of our ancestors reincarnation none of that garbage okay the only way to the Father is through the Son. So how do we get there, guys? The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. So A is to simply admit, yes, I am a sinner in need of a Savior. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Not some of us, all of us. Okay, so b is to believe and this is key believe that jesus christ is lord and that god raised him from the dead and c call upon his name the bible says that all who call upon the name of the lord will be saved not some of us all of us all who call upon the name of the lord will be saved we are saved by grace alone through faith alone in christ alone it is the gift of god not of works lest any man should boast. Eternal salvation is just that, eternal. We can't lose it. Okay, so that's a lie from the pit of hell. If the devil is telling you you lost your salvation, that God's mad at you, remember he's a liar and he does what he does well. I hate to give him a compliment. All right, so this is called the spirit and the bride say come. And I hope you guys are having an amazing day today. Um, it's rough got a lot of things going on in my own personal life but um we're not looking at that are we we're looking up right we got trials and stuff going on in our life but you know what god refines us through this and no eye has seen no ear has heard nor has entered into the heart of man what god has prepared for those that love him that is what we're looking at and you know what just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, there was a fourth one in that fire, and it was Jesus Christ. Okay, so we're not looking at our trial. As difficult as it may be, we're not denying that it exists now. Okay, I'm not saying denial. I'm not saying name it, claim it, because we're not part of that uh, new apostolic reformation movement. Um, we know that trials exist. The Bible says they will exist. But no eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor has entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those that love him. And whatever we're going through right now, we have to remember Jesus Christ is walking with us and in that trial with us. Psalm 91, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide 
in the shadow of the Almighty. Okay, so this is The Spirit and the Bride Say Come. And I published this book in 2008. Um, so it is even more so now. The rapture is more imminent this very second than it ever has been, guys. What is the rapture? The rapture is when Jesus Christ descends into those clouds, that trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ rise first, and we, this final generation, I believe, who are alive and remain, are caught up with them, harpotzled in those clouds, and ever so be with the Lord. And the Bible tells us to comfort one another with these words, encourage one another as we see the day approaching. And guys, that day is approaching like a freight train. If you don't have your ticket, there's only one ticket that has been broken and bruised for you. And his name is Jesus Christ. You need to get on board. I don't know if you've ever heard God the Father crying, but I believe that today I heard him crying. Depart from me for I never knew you. It's not something that God Almighty desires to say to anyone ever. It's simply not in his nature to reject. Truly, it would be a day of great sadness and loss simply because it was unnecessary, so tragic when such a great price was paid, a divine exchange eternally redeemed on behalf of all humanity. To behold the joy on his face when he whispers, enter in, will be a privilege beyond mere words and an honor belonging to Jesus Christ alone. Today, as I was putting the finishing touches on this book, I asked him if he wanted me to include anything else since his spirit has birthed its inspiration in my heart. Truly, I didn't expect such a grand finale of this magnitude, but I will attempt to express the Father heart of my God in the glorious vision manifested on behalf of his beloved prodigal. Allow me to set the stage for his majesty's royal stagecoach. It is the most glorious, shiny stagecoach, stagecoach flying swiftly, almost effortlessly throughout the land, the tabernacle being carried by strong gallon horses, galleon horses. Inside this most beautiful stagecoach, stagecoach I sat robed in beautiful bridal dress in the chamber that I'd come to know as the holy of holies the holy place as I sat in the presence of my father opening my heart fully to his majestic voice he slowly lifted my veil and looked deeply into the eyes of my soul I hungered hungered desperately to see his face but could only see his tears the chamber was quiet and serene as his sweet presence began to fill the temple, beckoning me to take my familiar seat upon the red velvet cushion opposite him. From previous experience, I had learned to fully anticipate his strong, delightful embrace, but today my needy soul stepped out of itself, and for a humble, unselfish moment in the life of my soul, I was hit with a sudden revelation that I was in the holy place today to minister to him, that the creator of this world's universe had faithfully entrusted me with issues dear to his heart and pertinent to his kingdom. Truly, I believe that this was my defining moment, the millisecond in time that I surrendered my childhood in the kingdom, yielding fully to, to the inherent privilege of being my father's daughter. Today, I understood completely that this life wasn't always about me. I finally understood at heart level that beyond my own selfish agenda, destiny awaited fulfillment, eternal fulfillment on earth as it was already ordained in heaven. What could a mere human being ever say to comfort the comforter? For the first time in my life, I was at a loss for words. Father, why are you crying, I asked, after a few moments of silence. I sat in silent reverence for, before his majesty, not knowing how to act or what to say to him. After all, it's rare that I'd witnessed a grown man cry, let alone God Almighty, the strength and power holding the universe together. Words alone could never convey the heartbreak imparted into my heart on behalf of God's beloved prodigal. Over the years, I'd grown accustomed to hearing his laughter, feeling the comfort and security of his embrace, where together we'd escape into the secret place, where time and eternity stood still. It was in this place where his spirit restored every broken piece of my ravaged soul, redeeming it for eternal good. The sound of my father crying was not something I desired to hear, but obviously it was a sound he desired for me to hear. The train of his, his temple. My train is caught in the door, his voice echoed sadly. What train, I asked, genuinely, genuinely clueless, as is typically the case when he speaks to me. The stagecoach continued to fly swiftly throughout the earth, picking up speed, yet I sat in my father's presence in perfect tranquility, oblivious to the fact that right outside this safe haven of rest, I was surrounded by very real danger, very threatening evil, and the very darkest of nights. Stand up, he said, you'll see. As he offered me his hand to stand, help me stand up, I immediately felt what he was talking about. My bridal dress was caught in the door of the stagecoach. As I began to move forward to pull it out of the door, his deep voice startled me. 
Daughter, you can't get the train of the the train out of the door like that. You're gonna tear it if you pull it on pull on it like that. I looked at him curiously in nervous anticipation, fearing that my beautiful white gown would rip or get dirty, and I couldn't risk ruining my ruining my royal gown, the a gift the groom had purchased himself. It was a dream come true, and I knew that I'd be wearing it to the royal wedding, the upcoming event that I had waited my entire life for. What am I supposed to do then? I asked tearfully. This train's going to drag on the ground and get filthy, I said, looking back in horror at, at my white gown jammed tightly in the closed door of the coach. Can't you do something, Father? I pleaded, my eyes full of tears. You're going to need to go outside and pull it back in, he said. Me? I asked in obvious dismay. You want me to go outside into that darkness and get the train with this wedding dress? You have got to be kidding me, I cried. This stagecoach is moving far too fast for me to get out of this and pull this train out of the door myself. What's plan B, I asked, hopefully, knowing in my heart that there wouldn't be a plan B. Don't worry, child, you're not alone, he said cheerfully, and you're certainly not the only one wearing this garment. Now is the appointed time for my train to fill the temple. I am the driver of the stagecoach, and you have the promise, my promise that you will not be harmed, for no weapon formed against you shall prosper. I'll slow the coach down long enough for you to pull it in, he said, his hand pointing urgently toward the darkness. The spirit and the bride say, come. Go now, open the door, and pull in the train. My spirit is with you, my bride. Bid them to come quickly, for the tabernacle is near completion, and the bells are ringing even now in celebration of the wedding supper of the Lamb. Go now, my daughter. I will hold the door open long enough for you to bring them safely into the chamber. Tell them that my heart is broken that Father patiently awaits their return, speak to the darkness and tell them to let my people go. Tell them I have heard their cries. Let them know that the door is open. Bid them to quickly come inside for the darkest of nights awaits if they miss my call. Okay then, I said, staring into his eyes with mixed emotions. I knew that this mission was a very serious one just by the tone of his voice. I reassured my already fearful flesh that if God had commissioned me to do this, then he had already given me sufficient faith, and although I couldn't see it or feel it yet, he had endowed me with everything needed for the journey ahead. I stood at the door waiting for it to open as he get, gave me one final embrace, receiving his oil of joy for the journey. Well, I said nervously, hurry up over this door, Father, before I lose my courage, and please remember to slow this coach down a bit. I can get killed jumping out into that ravenous crowd. Not waiting for a response, as was my traditional custom, I nervously rambled on, and Father, I don't know if you know it or not, but you really don't have many friends out in this crowd. As the door slowly opened for my departure, his sweet laughter echoed throughout the land. Neither do you. Neither do you. At that, the breath of life blew me into the dark, windy city and whispered again, Neither do you, my love. Looking around at the multitudes of unpredictable faces along the roadside, I shook my head and thought silently in my heart of hearts, I can't believe I actually left the warmth and security of my father's royal stagecoach to come here. Just look at this filthy place, I complained as I gazed over at the intimidating crowd, wishing I could just stick my tongue out at them. Why do I have to deliver God's message to such a mean crowd, I thought, feeling sorry for myself. After all, these folks aren't even the least bit welcoming, and they're certainly not my type. What could I possibly have in common with this crowd, I whined childishly. childishly. Follow me. Suddenly, a gentle voice interrupted my thought process. Did you just stick your tongue out? This voice asked, thundering through the dark hall of my now visible heart's closet. Without waiting for my answer, he continued on, I'm the one child who left my father's throne in glory to come and get you from this city, he said matter-of-factly. I wasn't even talking to you, I said quickly, embarrassed by his obvious intrusion into my thoughts. And I've certainly never been to this city. Do you have to follow me everywhere I go, I asked, regretting my hasty remark as soon as it slipped out of my mouth. Yes, I do, he said quietly, looking down at the unplowed ground in my heart. But actually, you should be following me, remember? I'm the leader, he said confidently. I'm so sorry, Lord, I said, genuinely repenting. For my attitude this is a very hard mission i really want to go home i said tears streaming down on my face we will soon he said stroking my hair i promise come let's go sit here at this well a while and get refreshed as i stared helplessly into his eyes my soul longed now for to hunger for what he hungered for and the kingdom once again became very clear as it began to come into focus suddenly it was as, as if his wonder for this journey had never left me follow me he said tenderly I'm so delighted that we're pulling my train in together. I have a passion for this train, and we need to let them know that they are already without spot or wrinkle, already my bride. His urgency and passion captured my heart as he led me through a dark alley around the corner. 
There's someone I'd like you to meet down this alley, he said softly, and she's been dying to meet you. This one's mine, he said, gazing down at the sleeping woman laying in a ditch. Jesus gently squeezed my hand as I stood in the darkness weeping, so thankful for the grace that had been bestowed upon me. Here comes the bride. She's part of my, pra my train, Jesus said, his eternal grin beaming now with pride beyond human understanding. Isn't she beautiful, beloved, he asked, his eyes now filling with tears, holding her as though she were a treasure beyond value, a pearl of great price. Beginning to understand just a small element of God's mercy, I began to, tr to cry, touched with eternal gratitude for his goodness and grace. As we carried the train gently down the unlit alley, my heart smiled at my Savior's perseverance. Once again, I witnessed the miracle of his unconditional love for all of humanity, a love capable of satisfying any fearful soul, a power strong enough to melt the icy walls surrounding every human heart. Derailment of the bridal train, the bridal train. As we sat together, thoughts of a train, train derailment began to fill my mind, of all things. A train doesn't, doesn't just derail because it wants to derail, especially when it's part of the greatest ride on earth. When I look back up at Jesus, he was smiling. Of course he was aware what I was thinking because he had planted those thoughts in my mind himself. He started to slowly explain that sanctification is like the emptying of a boxcar. Who cares what or what, what or who caused the derailment, the prodigal's derailment, why we left the church to begin with? We must, by the Holy Spirit, allow our souls to be emptied because without being emptied, we have no room to be filled. He said that my tragic derailment now serves a divine purpose in the Father's kingdom, and although concerns about derailment are indeed legitimate and bear careful scrutiny to avoid future derailments, Father is calling the Bride of Christ to come back aboard the swift moving train. The conductor bids you now to come aboard where derailment issues will be to discuss, but identity in the promised land never denied. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone not of works, lest any man should boast. It is the gift of God, free gift of God. Sabotage and foul play have played a primary part in your derailment while you were quietly sleeping in your boxcar, minding your own business. You've already at one time or another handed the conductor your ticket to get aboard, remember? Personally, I had forgotten that fact myself and forgetting that fact was one of the contributing factors to the crash. Rescue workers have now been commissioned on your behalf, child of God, and apparently I am one of them. 1 Corinthians 12, 18, But now God has set members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased him. Carrying the train. Where are you taking your train, Lord? I ask inquisitively, rushing behind him to keep up with his hurried pace. You know the church isn't even open at this time, at this hour. In fact, I think the door's locked, I offered quickly, knowing in my heart that he'd provide her with a shelter or find an empty box car to perform surgery in. He said that if the boxcars were stacked high full of stuff, he couldn't even use them for his purposes. And sadly, most of the boxcars were usually full when he needed to perform surgery on his bride. We're all so full of ourselves, aren't we? Suddenly, he stopped and turned around as though I said something wrong and said, he said, we're going home, of course. Oh, I said meekly, still un unsure of what he meant by home, but reluctant to ask him at the risk of sounding dumb. As I walked behind him on the deserted street, I couldn't help but notice the way in which Jesus carried her. She looked like a rag doll around his shoulders, each step jarring her limp body a little bit more. Yet the sleeping body remained oblivious that she was even being carried. Is she on drugs, Lord? Is that why she's sleeping? I asked shyly, hoping he wouldn't resort to using my own life as an example for his answers, as he often would. He kept up a brisk pace, walking quietly as though he was in deep thought. She is rather pretty, I said, trying to get a glimpse of her face now, buried firmly into his back. Honestly, though, she doesn't look like a bride, Lord, if you want my opinion. She's really kind of dirty, and I'll bet when she wakes up, she won't want anything to do with you at all, I said, hoping I hadn't hurt his feelings again. I mean, she's really not your type, if you know what I mean, I added cautiously, hoping to cover up the error of my statement. She probably won't even desire your purity or appreciate a friend as nice as you, I added. Anyway, you're going to have a lot of explaining to do to Dad when you bring her home like this. She's a mess if I dare do say so myself. I probably could have gone on with my list, but Jesus stopped abruptly and told me to sit down. I'm not tired, Lord, I said, hoping to impress him with my energy. We can keep walking if you'd like it. Anyway, you never answer my questions. I asked you where we're bringing her. I think she's starting to wake up. I pressed on, looking down at her tattered clothes and dirty face as I waited for a response. Sit down, he said, and get behind me. 
he pressed on firmly. I am sitting, I protested, and I am behind you, Lord, I said, confused by the fierce passion in his eyes. I'm not talking to you, he said with a gentle smile that lit up my soul, but confused me to no end. Who are you speaking to, Lord, I said with nervous excitement, a g nervous giggle. There's no one here but us. He gazed at me very intently and said, as long as you live upon this earth, my child, you will have an enemy. You are quite the peculiar one, Lord. Who said anything about an enemy? I, I said, snuggling closer to him. Anyway, I already know that, I said. Jesus continued. Your enemy will do anything to keep you, keep you from telling this story. What story is that? I asked inquisitively, hoping not to sound stupid again. Come up here and I'll tell you the story, he said, lifting me up into his arms along with his sleeping passenger. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Once upon a time, a groom stood knocking upon his bride's door. He loved her so desperately and knew that they were meant to be together, yet nevertheless was made to wait outside simply because of a terrible misunderstanding between the two of them. That's terrible, I said, gazing intently into his sad eyes as he continued to tell the story. The groom stood there for years as his bride invited other lovers into the house, watching as they walked in over the threshold, laughing. The groom knew for sure that although the lovers might bring temporary satisfaction, they would eventually destroy her soul and leave her heart empty, her dreams, killing her dreams and possibly even aborting her precious life. I sat in wide-eyed wide amazement as he continued to speak. Although he loved her passionately, he wasn't permitted into the house at all. He'd watched sadly day after day, year after year, as other lovers left the house laughing, mocking, and scorning his bride's so-called beauty. He'd reach out to touch her and even whisper her name as she passed him by, but she didn't even recognize her own name. On a few desperate occasions, she'd glance his way, but blinded by the misconception that he wasn't her type, She'd travel on alone. He continued on sadly. Although his own father had purchased the plot of ground that the house stood on, and although he laid the very foundation of the house, the bride contracted another builder to erect the house, an honor that the bride and groom were meant to share in together. And although he didn't like what she'd done with the place, he remained committed to her, having faith that one day in the not so distant future, his bride would allow him to knock down those faulty walls and build his own house. Why didn't he just go marry someone else, I asked, amazed that someone would actually endure the heartbreak, that heartbreak for the sake of an unfaithful lover. Because he knew her intimately before she knew herself, he continued on. I watched as his face lit up and his eyes slowly glanced toward heaven as if he were reminiscing somewhere in time. He continued on. The groom waited because he knew the end of the story. He also knew what delightful pleasure she would bring to his heart one day, with every room in the house radiating his father's glory. He knew very well that she was a gift to him, given to him by his father, and the groom trusted that whatever his father had declared, whatever his father had promised, he would do. So he waited and knocked. And although he longed to be comfortable in his own house, although he longed to make his bride see what he saw in her, she chose to remain a prisoner to the lies. I sat in still wonder, my eyes now tearing at the possibility of a love so genuine, a love so true, a love we read about only in fairy tales. Then slowly my gentle Jesus cut my face into his tendered hands and whispered, that's our story, my bride. You lift me up and I promise that I'll bring this train back home to my father myself. Right there and then I made a promise to my groom to declare his story all the days of my life or until the day of the wedding, whichever, whichever came first. Matthew 9, 26, and the report of this went out into all of that land. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. If you belong to Jesus Christ, you belong to him eternally. And we've let, allowed other lovers to come across the threshold of our home for many of us as prodigals for many years. And he has stood there at his own house, having purchased his own plot of land, and he has never left and will never leave because he will never leave us nor forsake us. The Spirit and the Bride say, come. Come unto Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, for nothing impure can ever approach the holiness of the Father's throne. The wedding of the Lamb has come. The bride has been made clean. Be prepared to behold very soon what I has never seen. Come unto Jesus Christ, for the time is drawing nigh when all of creation will bow to him 
and take that final sigh. His voice is the voice of rushing waters and his eyes of blazing fire. My friend, the trumpet will soon be heard and you'll discover that Satan is a liar. If you're reading or hearing these words and have not been washed by the blood of God's precious son, repent and be cleansed before it's too late. The spirit and the bride say come. Revelation 22, 17, the spirit and the bride say come and let him who hears say come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. So, you know, when we cut ourselves, we are the body of Christ, okay? And as the natural goes, so goes the spiritual. So what happens in our body? You know, we've allowed the prodigal, we've severed the prodigal population from us as a church. You know, the church is not a brick and mortar building so much. I mean, we go to church, to the church, a brick and mortar building. The prodigals don't go to church. They are the church. And I make no mistake for calling them the church. They are the church because they are robed in Christ's righteousness because of what he has done. Our sins, past, present, and future, forgiven at that cross. So their sins, just as well as the pastor's sins, are forgiven, past, present, and future. Jesus says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So there are a lot of prodigals out there right now that are born again. We are eternally born again because once we're born again, we're eternally born again. Understand that. We're adopted into God's very own family. And the enemy likes to put lies in our heads that we run with. Lies in our mind that we embrace as our own. And we run with them often for our entire life a lifetime of lies that become our life, a life of addiction, a life of fill in the blank. Satan is a liar. He came to steal, kill, and destroy what God Almighty loves and gave his life for. And if you're a prodigal out there and you're believing those lies, you need to reassess that Run to Jesus because he is there waiting with arms stretched open wide. The moment you said I do to the gospel, you were born again, cleansed of your sins, past, present, and future. And the Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And we are new creations new creations it's not like we're trying hard to be good none of us could be good remember so a lot of us think that we have to sustain our salvation and a lot of churches teach that you have to sustain your salvation to continue to be good once you're born again that's a lie from the pit of hell none of us could be good none are good that's why jesus christ had to die in our place all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of god so we're new creations created in, in Christ for good works that he prepared before the foundations of this earth. We're not saved by those works. We're saved for those works. Okay? So our born being born again and, and salvation is a one and done experience. It's a birthday. Salvation is a birthday. The moment we say I do to Jesus Christ. From then on is our walk. That's called sanctification. And that's where a lot of us fall and a lot of us never get back up for this reason this channel is dedicated to those prodigals who for lack of knowledge are perishing out there the bible says my people perish for lack of knowledge okay i love you guys i'm praying for each and every one of you know that um the joy of the lord is our strength and we need that strength so continue to just rejoice in him regardless of what the situation is we walk by faith and not by sight 
by faith and not by sight. No matter if the house is falling down, whatever's going on, don't look at that. Look at God's promises, his character, his truth. And soon and very soon, know that we're going to see our king. I love you guys. Until next time, keep looking up. Our redemption draws nigh. God bless you guys.